Our scripture reading this morning is found in Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Matthew 16, 13 through 20. Now when Jesus came into the district of Caesarea Philippi, he was asking his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? And they said, Some say John the Baptist, and others Elijah, but still others Jeremiah, or some of the prophets. He said to them, But who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon, Jama Simon by Jonah, because flesh uh, and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also uh, say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades will not overpower it. I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatsoever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven, and whatsoever you lose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. Then he answered the disciples and they, that they should tell no one that he was the Christ. If you were to go through the Bible from the Old Testament to the New and you were to ask the following question, what is the greatest Bible verse, what is the ba greatest Bible question ever asked, how would you respond? Now I realize that that is a very subjective question. That is a question that might be viewed through different eyes, through different lenses. There would be times when one passage of Scripture might appear more important or of greater significance than another because of the circumstances. But in all of the Bible, which is the greatest question ever asked? I got to thinking about this question as I was preparing this lesson, and I realized how easily an entire sermon, an entire series of sermons could be created on that very question. Let me give you an idea, at least very quickly, of some of the great questions that are asked in the Bible. One of the very first questions that we find in scriptures in Genesis chapter 3 and verse 1. After God's created the heavens and the earth, after he has created man and woman, Adam and Eve, and placed them in the Garden of Eden, he tells Adam and Eve, you can eat of any tree of the garden, but there's one tree, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, I don't want you to eat. And in chapter 3 and verse 1 of Genesis, the serpent comes along, Satan, and asks this question. Indeed, has God said you shall not eat from any tree of the garden? That was the beginning of his temptation for Adam and Eve. That was a very significant question because it's the first time when someone calls into question the authority of God. Before that point in time, Adam and Eve accepted what God said absolutely. But the serpent tempted them with a question. Well, you remember the story. They did both eat of that fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And in Genesis 3 and verse 11, after they've done this and after they suddenly realize they are naked and after they suddenly realize the wrong that they have done, the sin that they have committed, God asks them, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? Here's a question that arises that is the first question to allow someone to confess openly their wrong. In fact, what actually happens is Adam blames Eve and Eve blames the devil. It's somebody else's fault. So we have, based upon this rather significant question, two people who immediately start pawning off their responsibilities onto someone else. In Genesis chapter 4 and verse 9, we're introduced to a very familiar question 
Am I my brother's keeper? You remember when Cain killed his brother Abel, God confronts him. And Cain's response is one of question himself. It's the first time that we see a question answered with a question in Scripture. And that is to absolve himself of all responsibility, to try to shift the focus on what he had done to someone else. God, am I my brother's keeper? If you move on to Genesis 17, you find two people who ask a question. A husband and a wife by the name of Abraham and Sarah. And when they are old, very late in life, around 100 years old and 90 years old, Abraham and Sarah, God tells them they're going to have a child. And Abraham asks the question in Genesis 17 and verse 17, Will a child be born to a man 100 years old? And will Sarah, who is 90 years old, bear a child? In Genesis 18 and verse 12, Sarah laughed to herself when she asked the question, After I have become old, shall I have pleasure, my Lord being old also? By the way, Sarah was not the only one who laughed. Abraham also laughed because the idea that people so advanced in age could have a child was unimaginable to them. It was just funny that they would have a child. Those are the questions they asked. What about Moses in Exodus 3, 11 and 13 and chapter 4 and verse 1? The reason I throw all of those up is because this is the occasion where Moses comes face to face with that burning bush. A bush that is burning, but a bush that is not consumed. And what does he hear coming out of it? But a voice commanding him to go into Egypt and to tell Pharaoh to let my people go, to let the nation of Israel go, to free them from their captivity. What does Moses start doing? He starts making excuses. He starts asking questions that maybe will stump God. He asks this question in chapter 3 and verse 11. Who am I that I should go to Pharaoh and that I should bring the sons of Israel out of Egypt? In chapter 3 and verse 13, what if the people say to me, what is his name? What shall I say to them? Chapter 4 and verse 1, what if they do not believe me or listen to what I say? Well, Moses is asking questions, but he's not really looking for answers. He's looking for a way of escape. A little later on in the New International Version the translation where Moses finally gets out what he's had on his mind all along. He says, oh Lord, please send somebody else to do it. That was what he was looking for. He was looking for someone else to free him of this responsibility. What about in Job chapter 2 and verse 9? There's a very significant question that is asked of Job by his wife. You remember Job, this fellow who is being tempted by the devil, who's had everything taken away from him but his health, and he's still loyal to God. He's still faithful to the Almighty. And so finally, Satan goes back to God and says, let me take his health away. God says, okay, you can take away his health, just you can't take away his life. And so he's covered from head to toe in boils. And he takes a piece of clay and he's scraping the boils on his, on his body. His life has literally come to its lowest point. He's miserable. And in the midst of this misery, what uplifting words of encouragement does his wife give to him? She asks the question, do you still hold fast your integrity? Curse God and die. Are you still a man of principle? Are you still loyal to this God who's allowed all of these things to happen to you? I wonder how many people ask that question today. All this bad's happened to me. Am I still going to be loyal? Am I still going to be faithful? Am I still going to hold fast to my integrity? If I'm being treated this way, God must not care about me. Just curse God and die. Well, Job didn't do that. Job was faithful. He had a lot of questions, but he was also a man of patience. And God blessed him more than he had ever been prospered before. 
in the end. What about Isaiah chapter 6 and verse 8? This is where Isaiah hears the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send and who will go for us? We talk about the Great Commission today, going into all the world and preaching the gospel to all of creation. And some people like that question, who will go for us? And they say, well, the preacher will go for us. The elders will go for us. Missionaries will go for us. Other Christians will go for us. You know what Isaiah said? Here am I, send me. Who will go? Who will deliver the message? Who will live the life and share the will of God? That's a very important question. As we move to the New Testament very quickly, Peter asks a very important question in Matthew 18 and verse 21. He asks this of Jesus. He said, Lord, how often shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Up to seven times? Now, Peter was interested in forgiveness. He was interested in the reconciliation that forgiveness provides. But he seemed to be looking for a number. He seemed to be looking for a limit. Maybe he seemed to be looking for a minimal amount that he could be obedient to the Lord and still be found pleasing. That's a pretty important question. Maybe it, we wouldn't call it great, but we might call it significant because of the way we sometimes approach our faith. How little, Lord, can we give you? And it still be good enough. You know, we tell the guys in the school of preaching, when they get ready to go job hunting, we say, be careful of the brethren. Because they, too, ask some very interesting questions. When you go and try out, and when they have you in that room where, they're, where you're before the elders or the men or whomever, and, and they're asking you all these questions, sometimes a question like this will come up. What's the least you'll come here for? We tell those guys in the school of preaching, ask them this question. What's the most you'll pay? What about in Mark chapter 12 and verse 28, when a scribe came to Jesus and asked him this, this question, what commandment is the foremost of all? Which is the greatest commandment? commandment. Now certainly we've got to recognize that as being very important. Uh, that's a great question to ask. And, and Jesus answered it. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength and love your neighbor as yourselves. And basically all of the Bible falls into that. The idea that we would give God everything that we've got and also give one another what we would want to be given ourselves. That's a very Significant question indeed. What about what Jesus asks in Mark chapter 8, verses 36 and 37? For what does it profit a man to gain the whole world and forfeit his soul? He asks a, a second question as a follow-up. What shall a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall a man give in exchange? And the word for soul here means a person's life. What shall a man give in exchange for his life? If you accumulate everything in the world, if you've got riches and you've got power and you've got possessions and you've got honor and prestige among all people and you die, what good is all of that other? What will a man give in exchange for his soul? What about Luke chapter 18 and verse 18 and also Acts 16 and verse 30? where a question is asked on two different occasions. One by a ruler who is asking Jesus, good teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Another question that is asked by the Philippian jailer. Sirs, what must I do to be saved? Certainly that is an important question for us all to ask. What must we do to be saved in this life and in the life to come? What about John chapter 3 and verse 4? Where Jesus tells Nicodemus that you have to be born again in order to be saved. And Nicodemus doesn't understand that question. He doesn't understand what being born again means. The only kind of birth he understands is the one that came years ago when his mother brought him into this world. 
And so Nicodemus asks the question, how can a man be born when he is old? He cannot enter a second time into his mother's womb and be born, can he? Well, as much as Nicodemus did not understand what being born again was, in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37, because of Philip's teaching, the Ethiopian eunuch did have a much better understanding of what it meant to be born of water and the Spirit. When he asked the question, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? It's a great question to ask. Is there anything that is keeping me from clothing myself in Christ, coming contact with His blood, and having my sins washed away. Ananias taught Saul the gospel, and it got to a point where in Acts twenty two sixteen he actually asked Saul, who understood what he needed to do, but still wasn't doing it, he said, And now why tarriest thou? What are you waiting for? Saul, arise and be baptized and wash away your sins. Certainly a, a significant question to ask indeed of those who have been taught the truth but yet have not responded to the Lord's invitation. And for those who have obeyed the truth, Paul gives two questions to the church at Rome. One in Romans chapter 6 and verse 1 where he asks the question, are we to continue in sin so that grace may abound or so that grace may increase. Just because we're Christians, does that mean we now take sin lightly? Just because we have, been, we have access to the grace of God, do we take our own faithfulness lightly? And Paul says, absolutely not. We don't go on sinning. Those of us who have been buried with Christ in baptism have put to death that old man of sin. We've risen to walk in newness of life. In Romans chapter 8 and verse 31, Paul asks this very encouraging question, but a question we all need to keep on our minds. If God be for us, who can be against us? What is the greatest question the Bible ever asks? As I said before, that's a very subjective question. But in light of what we're talking about this morning, and in light of what the Bible represents to us all together, a book that is not just a, a group of stories that are for our reading and for our entertainment, but a synopsis of the will of God for man. The will of God for man. Man that He created, man that He loves, but man who sinned and fell short of His glory. And so what is the greatest question in the Bible? Well, maybe we should focus on the central theme to all of Scripture. What is at the core of this book? And that is the man, Jesus Christ. And maybe if we understand that Jesus is the central theme, then the question that Jesus asks today in Matthew 16, verses 13 through 20, is maybe the question that we ought to consider possibly as the greatest question we could ever ask. But who do you say that I am? I want you to consider this question that is first asked of us early in the text. In Matthew chapter 16, verses 13 and 14, we take a look at a question that Jesus asks His disciples. Who do men say, who do people say that the Son of Man is? Now I want you to notice the terminology that he uses first of all. He does not say Son of God. He says Son of Man. He identifies himself as a human. And as much as Jesus was 100% God, and we're going to address that in a minute, Jesus was also 100% human. He was just like us. He experienced joy. He experienced pain. He was a human being in all ways such as we are, yet without sin. So who do people say? Who do men say that the Son of Man is? Who do men say that the Son of Joseph, the Son of Mary is? Who do they say the carpenter's boy is? And it's very interesting what the disciples respond that they have gleaned from the people. Uh, they say, some say, you are John the baptizer. 
Now that's interesting. John and Jesus were related. They were relatives. But why would they say that? Who was John? Well, John, we know, was the forerunner of Jesus Christ. He was a powerful preacher. So was Jesus. People came out to hear him in droves. So they did with Jesus. There were a lot of similarities. But maybe one of the similarities that we see in Bible is the relationship that uh, John had to Jesus in the eyes of not only the people, but Herod. Herod, on one occasion, in Matthew 14, verses 1 and 2, said to his servants, This is John the Baptist talking about Jesus. He says, This is John. He is risen from the dead, and that is why miraculous powers are at work in him. Now, did Herod come up with this himself? No, not necessarily, because Mark 6 and verse 14 says almost the same thing. When King Herod heard of it, for his name had become well known, and people were saying of Jesus, the people were saying, of Jesus. John the baptizer is risen from the dead and that is why these miraculous powers are at work in him. You see Herod thought that Jesus was John because the people thought that Jesus was John. But Jesus wasn't John. To his question some of them said some people think Jesus you are Elijah. Now Elijah was one of the great prophets of old. He was the one who stood against the prophets of Baal by himself, against hundreds who would lay claim to a false god, Elijah alone standing up for the true God. And certainly Jesus had that in common with him because many times Jesus was alone. Many times Jesus was the one doing the talking. Jesus was the one doing the defending. But maybe there's another reason. In Mark chapter 9, verses 11 through 13, Jesus is asked this question. Why is it that the scribes say that Elijah, an Old Testament prophet, must come first? And he said to them, Elijah does come first and restore all things. And yet how, it is written, how is it written of the Son of Man that he will suffer many things and be treated with contempt? But I say to you that Elijah has indeed come and they did to him whatever they wish just as it is written of him when he says Elijah has indeed come he's not referencing the Elijah of the Old Testament he's referencing the Elijah of the New Testament and how the Elijah of the New Testament came and how the Elijah of the New Testament was mistreated and how we just talked about the Elijah of the New Testament was put to death in Matthew chapter 11 and verse, 13, verse 14, Jesus said to his disciples, If you are willing to accept it, John himself is the Elijah who was to come. John the baptizer was that modern day Elijah, not Jesus. What else did the disciples say? Well, they said that some people say that you are Jeremiah. Now we know that Jeremiah was known as the weeping prophet of the Old Testament because he shed tears over the condition of his people and over their failure to listen to and adhere to the will of the Lord. Jesus also shed tears. In Luke chapter 19 and verse 41, when Jesus approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and wept over it. And in fact, we had a lesson just a few weeks ago from a guest speaker who talked about John eleven thirty five, 35, the shortest verse in all of the Bible. But we know it because it reads, Jesus wept. Some of the disciples said that Jesus was maybe one of the other prophets. If he wasn't the modern day prophet John or Elijah or Jeremiah from the Old Testament, maybe he was simply one of the other prophets. And we see this from passages like Mark 16 verse 15 and Luke chapter 9 and verse 8 where many of the people considered that Jesus was not who Jesus was but simply another mouthpiece of God. But certainly not the one to come. Not the one prophesied about. Not the Messiah. But this is when we move into the next passage of Scripture where Jesus asks the question, but who do you say that I am? Who do you? No longer do I want to know what the people think. I want to know what you think. Now don't you think that Jesus knew what the people think, thought? 
Don't you think that Jesus knew what his own disciples thought? Why is he asking these questions? Maybe so that he can establish in their hearts as God tests us all the time. Tests us to greater faith. Maybe he was doing this to help them to understand the difference between how the world views Jesus and how they should view Jesus. Who do you say that I am? Let me tell you something. For all the times that we poke a little fun at Peter, for all of the times that we recognize and acknowledge that Peter falls short and does dumb things and things that you, you know he knows better than to do, he, he still does it anyway. For all the times that we poke at Peter, don't poke at him this time. Because this time he nails it right on the head. He says, you are first and foremost the Christ. The word Christ means anointed one. And since great people were anointed in the Old Testament, priests and judges, but more importantly, kings, what Peter is saying is, you are the anointed one. You are the king. You are the Messiah that we've been waiting centuries on to come and save us. Matthew chapter 1 and verse 1, the beginning of the genealogy of Jesus acknowledges that Jesus is the Messiah. And in verse 16, at the very conclusion of that genealogy, he is referred to the Messiah as well. John would be that forerunner of the Messiah. And John would acknowledge to his own disciples the greatness of Jesus. Peter says, you are the one. You're not one of many. You're not a great person among great people. You are the one. You are the greatest. You are the one who can save us all. That's who you are. And he tacks on to that. You are the Christ. And then he says to the Son of Man that you are the Son of the living God. Now I want to take that phrase kind of in reverse order for just a moment because if he's the son of the living God, then that means he is of deity himself. And if you turn in your Bibles to John chapter 1, we're going to read a few verses here and it might help you to read along with me. But John chapter 1 and verse 1, reading through verse 3 initially, we establish the deity of this person John refers to as the Word. He says in John chapter 1 and verse 1, In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was in the beginning with God, and all things came into being through Him, and apart from Him nothing came into being that has come into being. Now we know from the very beginning verse of the Bible, in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. We read in this passage of Scripture that the Word was with God, and the Word was God because the Word was the creator of all things, heaven and earth. In John chapter 1 and verses 14 and 15, we read that this Word, this God, this deity, this creator of all things, in verse 14, this Word became flesh and dwelt among us and we saw His glory. Glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. John testified about him and cried out, saying, This was he of whom I said, He who comes after me has a higher rank than I, for he existed before me. What did John say of Jesus? He's greater than I am. He is higher than I am because he existed before me. Now that's very interesting. Because we know in Scripture that John the baptizer was actually about six months older than Jesus. But he's not talking about the fleshly person. He's talking about deity. And what happened to that deity? Verse 14 says the Word became flesh. And if you jump down to John chapter 3 verses 14 through 16, we read a comparison in the Old Testament of Moses and the serpent in the wilderness to the son of man, to the son of Joseph, to the carpenter's son, and what he can do for us today. 
John writes, As Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up, so that whoever believes will in Him have eternal life. Why? Verse 16, For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Who do you say that I am? Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus gives three responses to Peter's acknowledgement that he is the Messiah come from heaven to save the world. That first response is found for us in verse 17. It is the passage of Scripture where he says, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah. And I just want to point out that for just a moment. Bar-Jonah, the prefix bar means son of. So when he says son of Jonah, he's saying, Blessed are you, Simon Bar-Jonah, son of your father Jonah. Now, that would be like me saying, call, or somebody calling me Kevin Bar-Max, because Kevin is the son of Max. In fact, my last name, Patterson, it comes down through the ages, meaning son of Patrick. So somebody up my Irish or Scottish lineage uh, was named Patrick, and therefore that's how my ancestors received this name. But I want to point this out to you because he acknowledges Peter as the human son of another human father. And then he goes on to say, flesh and blood has not revealed this to you. In other words, this did not come from the world. This did not come from your human ancestry. This did not come from your father Jonah. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you. But my father who is in heaven. How did the father reveal it to him? Well, through the evidence. Peter sat at the feet of Jesus, listening to him teach, listening to his words of wisdom, watching him perform miracles, watching him do things that were beyond people's comprehension, that blew the minds of not only the people, but Peter and the other disciples. And Jesus is saying, God has revealed this to you. He has given you the knowledge. He has given you the examples. He has given you the evidence through which you can draw this conclusion. You, based upon your faith that comes from God's will, have made this decision based upon what was revealed to you. The second response is given to us in Matthew 16 and verse 18. The first part of this verse also I do not include on the board because uh, Jesus says to him, I say that you are Peter. And although Peter's name means rock, it means little pebble. He then turns about around and uses a different Greek word, the word for rock, that means a big foundation, a big bedrock, upon which something is going to be built. And he says, Peter, upon this rock, and he's not talking about upon Peter. Peter's that little pebble, remember. But upon this rock, upon this bedrock of the confession that you made, upon this statement, this answer to my question, who do you say that I am? And you said that I am the Christ, the Son of the living God, based upon that rock of truth. I will build my church and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. Upon that building block, that foundation, that most basic element of faith, I will build my church. Now Jesus had not built the church yet. It would not be established until many days later. But on the day of Pentecost in Acts chapter 2, when Peter and the rest of the apostles preach the story of Jesus and convict the hearts of just a few on that day that indeed the Messiah had come and they had crucified Him, they also wanted to know what can they do about this problem. And Peter and the rest of the apostles were there giving them the answers. Verse 38 of Acts 2 would tell them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you. In the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. It's in passages like that that we see the early formation of the church. Because just later on in Acts 2, 
we would find that those who believed, who accepted the message and were baptized were added to the church, to the body of Christ, to the saved. Jesus says, upon this rock I will build my church and the gates of Hades, that means even death itself, will not be the victor over it. I want you to think about that. The king has come and the king has established a kingdom. And even death itself cannot win over it. Don't you want to listen to the king? Don't you want to be a part of the kingdom? So that when we die, that's not the end of it all or that's not the beginning of an eternal punishment as so many people teach, but that's going to be the beginning of truly our eternal victory in heaven. I want to be a part of that church. I want to be a part of that kingdom. And what Jesus then says in verse 19 has been a little bit of a struggle to people over the years, but I don't think it's something that we have to struggle with this morning. It's actually very simple. There's two fundamental points that are made. Jesus' third response to Peter in verse 19 is in first part the following. When he says to Peter, I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven. Keys represent the authority, the ability to unlock something. How many of us have locked our keys in the house or locked our keys in the car or lost our keys and we didn't have the ability to get in? Okay, Jesus has just been talking about the church. He's talking about the kingdom that he, the king, is establishing so that we can be citizens. And he's now saying, Peter, if you want to unlock that door because of your faith, I'm going to give you that answer. I'm going to give you that answer and I'm going to give all the answer who want to be a part, who want to open this door and walk through. But now that's going to be on them. I'm going to give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven. You and others have to choose to walk through it. The second thing that he says is, and whatever you bind on earth shall have been bound in heaven and whatever you loose on earth shall have been loosed in heaven. I want to read to you what one commentary says about this passage of Scripture. It says, Since the apostles preached the message given to them from heaven by the Holy Spirit, and he's referencing Acts 2, they bound and loosed God's will. To bind and to loose was a phrase often used by the Jews to mean to prohibit and to permit. If one bound something, he forbade it. If he loosed it, he allowed it to be done. Now I want you to think about all the people who were bounding things, binding things, and loosening things in Jesus' day. All the evidence that was available to other people, and some people were rejecting that evidence, that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. Some people, a few of them, were accepting that evidence that Jesus was the Christ, the Son of the living God. But think about us today. Are there people today who accept the Word of God? Are there people today who reject the Word of God? Do we realize that whatever we permit or refuse to accept in this life is going to determine our eternity after this one? That's all that Jesus is saying. It's really not that hard. There's a lot more to that that we could study. But the idea is, are you going to walk through that door or not? I'm giving you the keys. I'm giving you the answer. I'm giving you the way to eternal life. Here are the keys. Will you take it? Will you unlock the door and will you walk through it? Because what you do here and now, what you don't do here and now, is going to have everything to do with what is already being prepared for you in the eternity to come. It's very interesting that the last verse in our passage of Scripture this morning is where Jesus says in verse 20, Then He warned the disciples that they should tell no one that He was the Christ. I always find it interesting that Jesus is constantly telling people after He tells them something that they need to know or does something for them that they want done. He heals them, makes them well. He's constantly saying, don't go tell anybody. And some of them don't and many of them do. But because of Peter's great confession, now it's out in the open. Jesus 
the son of Joseph and Mary, the carpenter's son, is the Messiah. Because of this, don't tell anybody. Don't tell anybody that I'm the Christ. Why? Because his time had not yet come. He still had more work to do. And he needed other people to be eyewitnesses. He needed other people to hear his teachings, to learn from the will of his heavenly Father, to watch those examples of the many wondrous signs and miracles that he would perform in their midst, to demonstrate indeed that God was with him, that he in fact was God in the flesh. So as we close this morning, we have one final question. And the question is not so much a quotation of Scripture. It's certainly not something out of all of those many questions that we could ask from the Bible. The question is simply adapting this question that Jesus asked His disciples. And we're adapting it for us today. And that question is, who do you say that Jesus is? Because I want to ask you a question. Can you think of any question more important? There are a lot of great questions, a lot of biblical questions, a lot of important questions. But if you don't ask yourself that question, and if you don't come up with an answer to that question, those of you present today, I need to tell you that nothing else matters. Nothing else matters. Not how much do you get paid, where are you going to work, who are you going to marry, how many kids are you going to have, what are you going to name them, where are you going to go on vacation, what are you going to do this weekend, what's for lunch today. Even many of the biblical questions that we saw good men and women ask honestly with sincerity, nothing else matters if you don't ask yourself this question. Who do you say that Jesus is? If Jesus to you was just a, an interesting historical figure, a, a maybe even a great figure who taught a lot of good things that we ought to live by and things like that, maybe a good role model for us, if that's all you think that Jesus is, you'll learn some good things for this life, but it will mean nothing for you in eternity. Cast out away from the presence of God. But based upon your study, based upon your learning of God's will, based upon your opening of the Bible and listening to deity speak to you, based upon your learning, based upon your understanding, and based upon your faith, if you can acknowledge indeed that Jesus Christ was the Messiah, the anointed one, the chosen one, the king who came to establish a kingdom, and if you can understand that he was not just any man, but He was God in the flesh. God who did not have to leave heaven, but God who chose to leave heaven because of His great and powerful love for us. If you can recognize that He is the Son of the living God who came to the earth and died on a cruel cross for crimes that He did not commit, but for the crimes of sin that we committed. He gave His innocent life on that cross to pay the price, to purchase back pardon for our sins. If you believe that that's what He did, and if you are not a child of God today, take advantage of this opportunity to do what some of those other people did that we talked about who asked questions like, what do I need to do to inherit eternal life? What do I need to do to be saved? Put your faith into practice. Repent of your sins. Confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and be baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit for the forgiveness of your sins. And if you are a child of God, if you've come in contact with the cleansing blood of Jesus, who does Christ continue to be for you? When people look at your life, when people look at the decisions you make, the things that you say, the places you go, the people with whom you associate, how you live. Do they have any clue that you believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God? I hope that they do. I hope that they see Jesus Christ shining in each and every one of us just as brightly as we possibly can. 
But if something's gone wrong in your life, if you've strayed away, if you've forgotten just exactly who Jesus is and what He did for you, the invitation of Jesus Christ is open to you right here, right now, in this place, so that you can once again turn back to that truth, repent of your sins, and be, for, be forgiven by a loving God. This morning, one question. Who do you say that Jesus is? While we stand and sing.